My name is Jessie Hill. I am a professor uh, and associate dean for academic affairs at the law school at Case, um, and I, uh, my area of focus is constitutional law, and particularly one of the areas is reproductive rights. So um, I am going to be speaking today about the present and future of reproductive rights. What I want to do, uh, you, you may have heard that there was a... Um, big Supreme Court decision this past summer uh, dealing with uh, reproductive health and specifically abortion rights and Whole Woman's Health v. Hellerstedt. And so what I want to do with our talk today is to give you a little bit of context both nationally and, and locally across Ohio on the uh, state of abortion rights, reproductive health law, and then um, talk a bit about the decision itself and what it means going forward. Or, or what we don't know about what it means going forward. Uh, I guess, you know, also feel free to interrupt me while I'm speaking if you have a question to go ahead and raise your hand or, or, or I'll try to save some time for Q&A afterwards. Okay. So just to give you a broad overview of the national trends, by, um, for this year, for example, um, there, well, in general, the national trend has been toward increasing numbers of abortion restrictions being passed at the state level. So by mid-2016, 17 states had enacted 46 new laws restricting abortion specifically. Um, that little map up in the corner is the map of, of states that enacted anti-abortion measures in 2015, so pretty similar to a slightly larger number of of states, I think 21 or so, um, that enacted new restrictions. The states have adopted overall 334 abortion restrictions since 2010, which is almost a third of all abortion restrictions enacted since Roe v. Wade um, more than 40 years ago. On the bright side, for um, advocates of, of reproductive health care, states have passed 22 new measures expanding access <clears throat> to reproductive health services or protecting reproductive rights. Um, so California, I think, is the only state in recent years to have actually expanded abortion access in 2013. And that, that was not this year. That was in 2013. They passed a law allowing mid-level practitioners, you know, non-physicians um, to practice or to, to um, provide abortions. Most of the measures that are being referred to here have to do with insurance coverage of uh, contraception and um, insuring it and closing gaps and um, uh, uh, making sure uh, some states have enacted coverage of over-the-counter methods of contraception, for example, um, things like how much of a supply you can get at one time, things like that. Those are the sorts of... of um, positive reproductive health measures that we're seeing. Okay, this is just a little graphical um, visualization of this. This is from the Guttmacher Institute, Allen Guttmacher Institute website, um, which sort of shows you um, visually the, the trend toward restricting abortion. Um, so what about Ohio? Um, in the past five years, and I think I think this is a relatively uh, comprehensive list. Um, uh, Ohio has passed a number of abortion restrictions. The graphic on the side, which I know you can't read, um, is uh, from NARAL, um, uh, NARAL Pro-Choice Organization, which gives Ohio a grade of F on the um, uh, pro-choice scale. Um, so what has Ohio passed in the f past five years? Well, a uh, ban on post-viability abortion and, on, and a requirement that you test for viability after 20 weeks. Ohio has passed a ban on insurance for abortion in the Affordable Care Act exchanges. So no insurance companies on the exchanges are allowed to offer abortion insurance. Um, it's passed some amendments to its so-called judicial bypass law. That's the procedure whereby minors um, go to court if they can't notify their parents, um, but they need an abortion. Um, the, we, Ohio has passed some amendments to those requirements, making it harder to get. Uh, ban on pos public hospitals performing abortions. Um, then... Restrictions added to its requirement that all abortion clinics have what's called a, have a written transfer agreement 
with a hospital. Now, this is one I'll come back to because this is where a lot of the action has been in Ohio, and it kind of relates to the national scene as well. Um, but this basically written transfer agreement is, if you're not familiar with it, is just what it sounds like. It's an agreement between a um, ambulatory surgical facility like an abortion clinic or any other outpatient um, surgery center uh, with a hospital that sets out procedures for transfer of patients um, in the case of an emergency. So the Ohio um, adopted this requirement for all ambulatory surgical facilities, so not just abortion clinics, but, um, you know, I don't know, little surgery centers where small procedures are performed. Um, uh, They adopted that back in 1995, but have increasingly been tinkering with it to make it tougher and tougher. Um, uh, In the past five years, Ohio has added a requirement that Um, It has to be with a local hospital defined as being within 30 miles, um, that no public hospital can enter into one of these with an abortion clinic. Um, So that's only abortion clinics that are restricted in that way. Um, They've um, also made amendments to the variance uh, procedure. There is a a procedure for getting a variance from this requirement that is um, onerous, and they've made it tougher. Uh, and have said and basically tried to pass a law most recently saying if you can't get um, or if you apply for a variance the Department of Health has to act on it within 60 days if the department doesn't act on it within 60 days it's automatically denied and if it's denied your license your ambulatory surgical facility license is automatically suspended Um, so uh, uh, like I said, I'll get back to that in a minute because that's become a very important restriction for um, abortion providers in the state. Uh, the With the 2013-2014 Ohio budget bill, um, the uh, legislature also included some abortion restrictions, including what I've called the heartbeat informed consent requirement. Um, that uh, does not... Um, or that requires abortion providers to offer the woman the opportunity to see or hear the heartbeat uh, before 24 hours before she has an abortion. And the physician also has to tell her, or the provider has to tell her, the statistical probability of carrying the pregnancy to term if she were not to abort it. Um, Okay. Uh, uh, there's, I, I don't, I, I really never know what to say about that requirement. Um, finally, you might have heard a little bit about the Planned Parenthood defunding uh, uh, case because there's been some recent, or legislation because there's been some recent litigation around that. It actually doesn't specifically single out Planned Parenthood, but it mainly affects Planned Parenthood in that it um, provides that no state funds or certain kinds of federal pass-through funds um, can go to um, any entities that provide abortions or um, their affiliates, even if they're being used for, the funds are being used for non-abortion related activities. Um, Some things that are in the pipeline um, that are widely expected to pass, you never know, but expected to pass, um, or being considered. Uh, Banning abortion for a diagnosis of Down syndrome, there's an active bill um, uh, in the works right now, so uh, you can't have an abortion if you're having it because of a Down syndrome diagnosis. Um, A a requirement that you have to bury or cremate fetal remains, um, as opposed to disposing of them in the way that Um, Actually, all medical facilities have traditionally disposed of all human tissue and um, uh, medical waste. Um, This was, this hasn't been adopted, again, these are not adopted, these are proposed or or kicking around, but this is um, a sort of reaction to the big flap you may have um, paid attention to around these allegations that Planned Parenthood was selling uh, fetal parts, right? And and there were these undercover videos that were heavily edited, and then all these investigations that haven't actually turned anything up. But um, and, and that actually didn't involve Ohio anyway. But um, but nonetheless, um, the Ohio legislature is just um, getting getting on the ball with that one. So um, so there's a there's a, a proposal there. 
also, I don't know, the heartbeat, there's, there's this heartbeat abortion ban that keeps kicking around. You know, who knows whether it's coming back again this session where the legislature tries to uh, basically define a viable fetus as one that has a heartbeat and and to say that abortion, which is around six to seven weeks of pregnancy, um, uh, and to say that um, that is the point at which you can no longer have an abortion. They chopped off a part of this and passed it with the budget bill. That was the informed consent requirement. That was originally part of this bigger abortion ban bill. I guess the other thing um, that I didn't put up there but that that might pass in the next session is um, uh, a 20-week abortion ban. So no abortion after 20, week, which is 20 weeks pregnancy, which is actually still before the point of viability. We've been seeing a lot of those nationally, and Ohio has been considering one as well. Um, so it's, it's quite a list. It's, um, I, th- I think the only reason it isn't longer is that they're starting to run out of ideas at this point because sort of everything, um, every anti-abortion restriction you can come up with pretty much tends to pass um, in Ohio. Um, they, they pass them as fast as they can conceive of them. Okay. Um, so this has resulted, unsurprisingly, in some litigation, and this is some of the major um, constitutional litigation that is pending in Ohio right now um, around uh, abortion restrictions that the legislature has passed. So this is, since 2004, actually, the first one has been pending, and it's just about wrapping up. There's only attorney's fees left to uh, decide at this point. Um, But that was a case involving, Ohio was actually the first state in the country to pass restrictions on how medication abortion was performed. So how physicians, so, so abortion can be performed up to now, it's up to 10 weeks of pregnancy safely um, using only medication, non-surgically. And um, Ohio was the first state in the country, and a few have followed suit, trying to tell physicians basically how they could prescribe the drug, what dosage they had to use, how long they could use it for. Um, the, the law essentially required physicians to follow the FDA labeling, um, the, and which reflects the FDA re- labeling reflected the protocols that were used in the clinical testing that led to the p- approval of the drug. However, by the time this law was passed, 2004, those protocols were about 10 years old. Um, the, uh, they had become out of date, and physicians had figured out that actually it was um, uh, uh, better for the woman, most likely, and more effective to give a, a, actually a lower dosage of the drug, and that it could be used later into pregnancy. Um, uh, the Ohio law cut off the use of the medication at seven weeks whereas it can be safely used until 10 weeks of pregnancy. So um, uh, I, I kind of, I, I, even though, like I said, this law is all, this, this litigation is almost wrapped up because what happened is recently in the past year, the FDA actually changed the labeling or, I mean, the manufacturer had to request it, but the FDA agreed to a label change that reflects current practice now. Um, so... The, there's really no longer a dispute, and the case is, has um, been voluntarily dismissed. Um, but I, I raise it just because you might have seen also that there was a, a news story about a study being released recently that indicated um, uh, it was a lot of the study was was done um, based on medical records from Ohio while this law was in effect, that the effect of the law was actually to cause more side effects and less effective um, treatment than um, than the evidence-based usage, evidence-based regime that was used elsewhere in the country so that the law was was not helping women's health at all, in other words. Um, there's a challenge preterm, that I'm involved in, um, uh, preterm v. Kasich, which is a constitutional challenge to the these um, uh, provisions that were tucked into the 2013-2014 budget bill. Um, the challenge is actually in state court uh, that claims that these abortion restrictions should not have been stuck into a budget bill. It violates the one-subject rule of the Ohio Constitution. So we have this weird one-subject rule in our Constitution. Yeah. Quick question. As a practical matter, have any studies been conducted regarding the impact of these more onerous regulations in Ohio as to the number of abortions? Uh, right. Actions. 
Good question. So um, the, as to your first question, whether there's been any study of the impact all, overall on kind of abortion rates or abortion access, it's very hard. I mean, we know that the abortion rates have dropped in Ohio um, quite a bit. They've dropped across the country, actually, as well. Um, it's but it's very hard to know what the cause of that is, right? So, so um, uh, I'm not aware of any st- uh, studies that are able to actually draw a causal relationship between the drop in abortions. Um, as I'll show on the next slide, there has been a significant drop in the number of um, uh, clinics. But again, you know, I, I mean, and honestly, I think a lot of people believe that a big cause for the drop in abortion rates has been the um, availability of uh, long-acting contraception um, that is more effective, so better access to more effective contraception. Um, so I'm sure there's some there's some effect, but it's it's just hard to know. Also, women going out of state that it's just you can't you know there's so many possibilities and you can't really like talk to these women at the moment, right? Or it's very hard. Um, uh, prosecutorial activity. I mean. Uh, You know, basically, again, I'll show you on the next slide, but our clinics are all clustered in the major cities, which tend actually not to have the most conservative, I think, prosecutors' offices. So um, the real effect of abortion restrictions, most of which are criminal uh, penalties imposed on physicians or which carry criminal penalties, some of these more recent ones are, are affect the clinics. But the ones that affect physicians, I mean, the real effect is the chilling effect. Uh, physicians on the whole are pretty risk-averse folks, right? I mean, they've worked very hard um, to get their, their licenses. They're not going to do anything that puts it on the line. So, um, so we don't see a lot of actual prosecutions um, for violating these laws. Most of these challenges are pre-enforcement challenges, right? Challenging clinics, challenging um, uh, the law sort of on its face before it gets enforced against anyone. Okay, Planned Parenthood v. Hodges is a, a challenge that's pending. One of the more recent ones, there's actually two of these Planned Parenthood v. Hodges. They're separate cases, but um, Hodges is the director of the Ohio Department of Health. Um, a challenge to um, some of the stricter aspects of the written transfer agreement requirements. Um, uh, right now, there's a preliminary injunction in place against that requirement that I told you about that um, your license is automatically suspended if the Ohio Department of Health just sits on it for 60 days. Um, uh, the the uh, Judge Barrett and oh, yeah, it's Judge Barrett in the Southern District found that that was um, a, a due process violation. Um, but the litigation's ongoing. Capital Care v. State of Ohio is a one clinic left in Toledo fighting to stay open, can't get a written transfer agreement. Um, it's been sort of appealing its um, uh, inability to get a written transfer agreement up through the um, uh, state courts now after having finished with the administrative uh, process. So they couldn't get a written transfer agreement and then couldn't get a variance from that requirement and have been appealing all the way up. Um, they've raised some of the similar claims that are in preterm v. Kasich. Um, and now, actually, that case you might have also read, the, um, they won in the trial court. They won on appeal in the 6th District, Lucas County. Um, the court found that the, the laws, the written transfer agreement, as it operated against capital care clinic, was an undue burden un- after Whole Woman's Health v. Hellerstedt. Um, it was um, a violation of the one subject rule of the Ohio Constitution, and it was also um, a violation of something called the non delegation doctrine. The state just appealed that to the Ohio Supreme Court. So this case may be getting decided if the Ohio Supreme Court takes it um, uh, in the near future. And then finally, another Planned Parenthood v. Hodges, which is the Planned Parenthood defunding case where, again, I believe it was, again, Judge Barrett found that um, the the law essentially imposed unconstitutional conditions. It penalized an organization for exercising a constitutional right and for its right to speak and advocate about abortion rights and um, therefore was um, unconstitutional. So there's a uh, actually there's a permanent injunction in place in that case. Okay, so here's where you can see the the impact a little bit. Um, 
I actually think that the map is not accurate, um, but it gives, I think the number is accurate. So in 1999, there were 22 clinics providing surgical abortions in Ohio. Today, there are only nine. Um, they're all in the major cities. Um, uh, I, at least four of those remaining clinics are in jeopardy of losing their licenses. Uh, so, and I think that actually what I think is wrong about this map is it indicates there are three clinics in Columbus and none in, in northwestern Ohio. There's actually one that's fighting to stay in business in, in Toledo, and I think there are only two in Columbus. I could be wrong about that, but I'm pretty sure there are only two. Um, so if in one of those clinics that's st fighting to stay open is in Cincinnati, you can see that's the only one left. There's one in Cincinnati and one in Dayton. Both of those clinics are fighting to stay open. And if they close, Cincinnati will become the largest metropolitan area in the country without an abortion provider. So um, what is going on, by the way? Why has this um, uh, method of restricting abortion been so brutally effective in closing clinics? Um, that's actually the term the lower court used um, in the whole woman's health case, brutally effective. Um, so the written transfer agreement requirement really sounds pretty innocuous, but it's really all about that. So the written transfer agreement requirement, you just have to have an agreement with a clinic to, um, uh, to trans, I mean, with a, with a hospital to transfer your patients there. Well, um, no ASF in the state has ever had a problem with this requirement, ambulatory surgical facility, except an abortion clinic, right? Only abortion clinics have trouble with this requirement. Everybody else gets them. It's no big deal. Uh, the reason no one has ever had to seek a variance from this requirement, except an abortion clinic. So, except abortion clinics. So, um, the reason is that, you know, the hospitals don't want to give them written transfer agreements, even though the hospitals will absolutely take any patient that shows up at their doorstep um, uh, needing emergency care. As a matter of fact, they're required to by federal law, even though really the, the complication rate is extraordinarily low, and it's quite rare that patients ever need to get transferred from a clinic to a hospital. And, and, if, and even though if they do have a complication, they probably are likely to have something that occurs at home afterwards and go to the hospital that's closest to them, not the one they traveled, you know, 100 miles to get to, um, not, you know, near the clinic that they traveled 100 miles to get to. But, you know, hospitals don't want to give them either because, well, they can't because they're restricted by law because they're public hospitals. And in Ohio, public hospitals can't have these written transfer agreements. Or maybe they're Catholic and they therefore cannot, um, consistent with the ethical and religious directives that uh, uh, govern them, get, they feel that they can't give written transfer agreement requirements. Or maybe they just don't want the hassle because um, uh, they're going to, it's possible they're going to get a lot of political pushback, either members of their board or members of the public who learn about it um, are, are going to push back. So Cincinnati, uh, the Planned Parenthood can't get a transfer agreement in Cincinnati. They used to have one with the University of Cincinnati, but when the hus public hospital ban uh, was enacted, University of Cincinnati uh, had to terminate Every hospital in Cincinnati is Catholic or public. Um, even the Jewish hospital in Cincinnati is Catholic. So <laughs> uh, 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 clinics cannot, they cannot get them. So instead they have to apply for a variance. There is a procedure, it's somewhat onerous, it involves finding a number of backup doctors and the, the Department of Health won't ever tell you exactly how many you need. Sometimes it's one, sometimes it's three, sometimes it's four. It really depends on how many you put in your um, application and then they decide. But you need to have a number of backup doctors who have admitting privileges, who don't necessarily work at your clinic, who maybe just are in practice out there, who have said, yes, if there's a complication, I will admit, I will admit this patient to the hospital. So um, uh, that's been a bit of a moving target. Some clinics have managed to get those backup doctors. Actually, when the Dayton Clinic finally managed to locate some uh, backup doctors, um, some protesters made their names public and drove um, uh, trucks around with pictures of aborted fetuses on them in front of the doctor's houses and in their neighborhoods saying that they were um, uh, complicit with providing abortions, and then those backup doctors pulled out. So um, uh, it, it's, it's, been a bit of a, um, it's been a bit of a challenge, and that is why, you can't always say that's 100% why, but it's a big part of the reason why clinics are really struggling in Ohio. 
So what's the news on the other side? Whole Woman's Health v. Hellerstedt. So this past summer, the Supreme Court decided Whole Woman's Health. And it's very relevant to this issue, although it didn't involve a written transfer agreement requirement. It did involve an Ohio, or sorry, a Texas law um, requiring physicians on staff who perform abortions to have admitting privileges at a local hospital. This is not the same thing as a written transfer agreement, but it functions very similarly. Hospitals give them, give admitting privileges based on their own criteria. It doesn't, uh, they, they can give them or not give them for any reason or no reason whatsoever, pretty much. Um, and so it can be very difficult for physicians to attain because of the same reasons, res- uh, hostility to abortion, um, uh, Catholic hospitals, and so on. Um, in addition, the other aspect of the law that was challenged in Whole Woman's Health was these ad- um, ambulatory surgical center requirements that were actually quite burdensome and expensive to conform to. So there were physical, there were requirements about if you were going to have a clinic which had to qualify as an ambulatory surgical center, they basically had to be, you know, mini hospitals with, um, uh, you know, certain physical plant requirements, size of of, of recovery rooms and doorways and parking space and staff. And, and this was, you know, anesthesia staff at a level that you would never need if you were performing a fairly basic, you know, first trimester abortion. Um, these even applied to facilities where only medication abortions were performed, so that where there was no actual surgery. And they were so expensive, plus that combined with the admitting privileges requirement that um, was difficult for many clinics to meet, would have closed about three quarters of Texas's clinics, leaving it with only about eight to 10 clinics for its entire population, the entire geographical space. And most of them were concentrated, all of them actually were concentrated in the big cities. So um, women in rural areas uh, would have to travel hundreds of miles each way to access abortion, particularly the Rio Grande Valley, which is um, uh, near the border with Mexico and is, is quite impoverished, um, uh, would have, it, the distances would have been uh, hundreds and hundreds of miles. So in a five to three decision this summer, written by Justice Breyer, Uh, the Supreme Court struck down the Texas law and held that it imposed an undue burden on abortion rights. That's been the standard since Planned Parenthood v. Casey in 1992, that um, a law is unconstitutional if it imposes an undue burden on abortion rights. Um, So um, this was a huge victory for the pro-choice plaintiffs, and it was, you know, rightly celebrated as such. And, I mean, surprise, surprise, Justice Scalia's absence didn't even matter, right? It didn't have an impact. Um, uh, it was a decisive, decisive ruling and had a lot of things uh, for the plaintiffs to be thrilled about. I'll say more about that. I think it also leaves open a lot of questions, and I'm not, um, I'm, I'm not sure that the champagne is warranted quite yet, or still maybe, I should say. So... Um, some of the one, one of the key things that the court said here was that you have to if a law is enacted supposedly to protect women's health and safety which is what these requirements were claimed to do that was claimed to be the state purpose the court said you have to balance the actual safety benefits uh, against the burdens those laws impose on abortion rights so here you know, this was going to close three quarters of the clinics in the state for what turned out to be extremely minimal health and safety benefits. Um, for the reasons I just talked about with respect to the written transfer agreement requirement, a lot of those points apply to the admitting privileges requirement. So, um, uh, you know, you, the, the safety benefits from having admitting privileges when the uh, admission rate is extremely low and uh, lower than for colonoscopies actually. So abortions are safer than colonoscopies, um, uh, tonsillectomies, things like that. Uh, So considering that and considering how unlikely it is that patients are actually going to go to the hospital near the clinic and that the clinic, the hospital couldn't turn them away anyway, um, the the court said there's really no benefit on the other side or or extremely minimal, if any. Um, The court also emphasized that I mean, this is actually the very fact that it said that there was this balancing required, that this balance really told you whether the burden was undue. It's not just about how much access are we cutting off, but, but for what good, right? That was a really important holding. The lower courts had been disagreeing about whether 
the existence of any medical benefit at all was relevant to the question. So some courts just said, we don't care. The state, we, we're just going to take the state at its word. We don't care what your evidence says about how safe abortion is and whether these actually provide any incremental benefit. Um, uh, so, so because of that, it really, you know, it, it really made a difference that the court said we're actually willing to look at evidence. The court also looked at the impact on um, poor rural women, um, which is maybe the first time I think ever, or maybe since like the 60s or 70s, that the Supreme Court has shown any interest in how any law affects, um, affects the poorer uh, members of the population. And, um, and the court made it clear that it would really um, not, it was not going to defer to anyone on the evidence, that this is a fundamental right, and it was really going to look, courts should really look um, uh, to see whose, whose position is actually supported by the evidence. Okay, so, so the good, from my uh, perspective, like I said, is that the Supreme Court really affirmed the fundamental status of the abortion right, and that courts will have to look at actual evidence from now on. Um, this is part of what was, by the way, going on with the, um, the medication abortion restriction in Ohio that I mentioned on an earlier slide that Ohio had enacted these restrictions for which there was no evidence that it was benefiting women's health. And in fact, now that the evidence is in, showed that it actually harmed women's health. But the court, and all the way up through the Sixth Circuit said, well, not the trial court, but the Sixth Circuit said, mm, we don't care. It's not, we take the legislature at their word. We're not going to look at what the actual impact is. So now that we have this new framework, it really does make a difference that courts have to look at health and safety evidence. Because, you know, you can't get away with pretext anymore. I think a lot of laws are, are going to be newly vulnerable um, to being struck down after whole woman's health. So 10 states or so had admitting privileges requirements. Those are probably pretty much gone. I mean, the Supreme Court denied cert in a couple of cases where the appeals court had struck them down. Um, other, there's another case where the state just sort of dropped um, the appeal. Uh, I think there are a couple still out there, but they're probably not long for this world. Um, you know, the written transfer agreement in Ohio, um, I, I, I think um, it, it may also be quite vulnerable under the whole woman's health standard for many of the same reasons. Uh, telemedicine bans, so bans on, on allowing the use of telemedicine for abortion. There are a handful of states, maybe 10, 15, that have those. Um, again, those are supposed to be health and safety measures. There's no real evidence to support that um, view, and so those are probably vulnerable. Other so-called trap laws, we refer to these as trap laws, the ASC requirements and things like that, physical plant requirements, um, those may be vulnerable, although that's a little hard to say. Um, so, you know, um, that was a much more fact-intensive part of the opinion. And what is, what is a trap law? What is an ASC requirement? It really, there's not one set of things that qualify as that. So, you know, Ohio has requirement that abortion providers be certified as ambulatory surgical facilities. There are some uh, regulations that all of the existing clinics have managed to sort of conform to that don't, they're certainly not as burdensome as Texas is. Texas actually had significant regulations in place before HB2, the law that was challenged in Whole Woman's Health. So, you know, and, and those, it didn't challenge as an undue burden. So it, where you're going to draw the line, how burdensome is too burdensome um, uh, with, with these trap requirements or, or ambulatory surgical facility requirements, not totally certain, but maybe. Some of them will certainly be vulnerable. And then maybe um, some informed consent requirements that are floating out there in different states, not Ohio, but there are certain states where you have to tell women that having an abortion increases your risk of breast cancer, that it increases your risk of suicide. Um, in South Dakota, you have to tell her that she's terminating the life of a whole separate living human being. Um, so, you know, so, some of these things are not supported by any um, medical evidence, and um, those may also be vulnerable after Whole Woman's Health. But um, I'm being a little equivocal here because I feel like it's, um, there's a lot of question marks as well. Of course, you know, the Supreme Court decides this big issue that's been kicking around in the lower courts for years. And, um, you know, it's, it's going to write a long opinion, but there's only so much you can cover, right? There's only so many questions you can answer once you decide this case. So um, it was a good opinion. It was very 
record-based. It was very fact. If any of you read it, you'll be surprised. You can tell that Justice Kennedy didn't write it because it's not all about dignity and uh, you know, liberty finds no refuge in a jurisprudence of doubt and you know these sweeping right phrases. It's um, it's it's briar. It's technocratic. It's very. It's got bullet points. You know. Um, so you know, the, I think there's a question though. Um, given the record in this case, this was not. This was an as applied challenge for the most part. The procedural is a little complex procedurally, but it was so part of the law had already gone to a, into effect and had already closed half the clinics in Texas. They had a lot of data about what impact this was having. Um, it's not clear really what kind of showing you're going to have to make going forward to win in these cases. And it was so extreme in Texas. You know, do you have to close three quarters of the clinics to, um, do you have to close a clinic with your regulation for it to be burdensome? How much burden outweighs how much benefit, right? Again, this is a balancing test. This is always the question with balancing tests. But given that we had, in a way, such an easy case, right, um, in a way, it's, the, it's an easy case that um, uh, potentially makes it hard going forward. What about if it just makes abortions more expensive? What if it just raises the cost for providers? Um, also, not all abortion restrictions are justified in the name of women's health and safety. So these, the, the new trend had been to pass these laws that were supposed to be intended to protect women's health and safety. Um, uh, these so-called, you know, these written transfer agreement requirements, these admitting privileges requirements, these ASF or ASC requirements that um, looked really neutral and uncontroversial, and they said that's just making abortion safer. We're not trying to make it illegal. We're trying to make it safer. And um, uh, the, as I noted, these were, um, to quote the lower court in Whole Woman's Health, brutally effective at closing clinics across the country. Um, and so that's why they were so popular. But there, were, there are also other laws out there that are not justified on this basis. And, and the court has made clear in Planned Parenthood v. Casey that states can pass laws out of respect for fetal life. So um, uh, there are laws like ultrasound you know, requirements. There is the, I mentioned the proposed Down syndrome ban, for example. These are not health and safety laws. These are laws about a certain um, notion of, of fetal dignity or uh, potential life. Um, and how do those, are those subject to the same balancing test under Whole Woman's Health? How do you balance, what, how do you weigh that benefit on one side versus the burden, right? Um, and so really I think that the, the, the key here is that there's still a lot of room for lower courts to determine the meaning of whole woman's health, at least in the short term. You know, uh, maybe uh, there, there will be another clarifying decision down the line, uh, probably, I'm, I'm going to guess if um, President Trump is appointing <laughs> Supreme Court justices, that decision could come sooner rather than later. Um, uh, but uh, uh, in the meantime, there is just a whole lot of room for lower courts to make pronouncements about what kind of record is really required under Whole Woman's Health, what constitutes a benefit, what constitutes a burden, um, uh, how many clinics have to close, and so on. And so it really is still, uh, as it was before to a large extent, uh, the fate of uh, abortion rights are in the hands of the lower court judges for now. So um, I think I'm going to stop there and see if we have any, I guess I can keep talking if I need to, but um, see if we have any uh, questions or, or anything for discussion. Okay, yes. No, so that only applies that pocket veto idea. Well, first of all, it's been um, essentially, it's been um, since since there's a preliminary injunction against the automatic suspension, it doesn't really matter because if they don't rule, you still get like to wait until they rule to keep you know until you lose your license. So, um, but 
So that only applies if you need a variance. So if you are just applying for your license and you have a written transfer agreement, then you go to ODH and you put that in your packet and then they, they rule on it or they decide on it when they decide on it. But the, the losing your license and the 60 days and the automatic suspension is only if you are applying for a variance because you haven't been able to get a written transfer agreement. You would be surprised, um, by the way. I mean, we do have um, uh, more sympathetic hospitals here. We don't have, you know, clinic and UH major entities are not um, uh, obviously Catholic or public, but it's not as easy as you think. And uh, nobody wants controversy, right? And everybody's got some board member uh, who is going to potentially raise a stink over this. So so they do um, uh, give written transfer agreements, but it's not as non-controversial as you might think it is here even. Um, uh, every, the other aspect of the law that was passed, and this was part of the 2013 amendments, was that a new, clinics have to get a new written transfer agreement every two years. So it used to be the clinics around here, they had one with one hospital, and it was like, you know, automatically renewing. So just every year, you know, they never had to think about it again. Now you have to get a new one every two years, which requires going through this process of, you know, negotiating, seeing if the right people will sign off on it, worrying about, you know, whether or not that's going to happen again. Um, uh, so it's it's actually they they do definitely do not feel as secure as as you might expect even in the Cleveland area. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah. Can I ask a question about the variance you talked about on the transfer agreement? Uh huh. It sounds almost like you're setting up like a straw man that you can go to and they can attending physicians and essentially say we're gonna the hospital doesn't have to do it directly, but since I'm the attending physician, mm-hmm. I'm gonna submit them as a patient. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, I think around here it's, it doesn't come up because, um, for the most part, because um, the, you know, they, they're able to get these written transfer agreements. But the other restriction, by the way, that's in the law, I keep remembering new ones to mention, is that you can't, no physician who's employed by a public hospital can be one of those physicians. So, again, you see, for example, in the University of Cincinnati, you know, they can't, their physicians can't. So it has to be someone in a private group or employed, you know, by... Right, right. So it's tough. And and actually this, so the, the requirement has actually been litigated for many years. The first case started in like maybe 2003, 2004, because the Dayton Clinic couldn't get an agreement, a written transfer agreement. They had one, and then under pressure, it was Miami Valley Hospital, I think, had to, it, they dropped it. Um, and then they he, they uh, found a backup doctor, but didn't want to make the doctors or found some backup doctors didn't want to make their names known. Um, and the court basically told them, you know, you have to tell ODH who they are. And and then it becomes public record essentially. So now they, they're having these problems with the backup doctors. Um, in the course of this litigation, which I, I'm also involved in, the most recent iteration of it. Um, the 2015 Planned Parenthood v. Hodges, um, that's the one around the automatic suspension provision. That's that's the part that's currently enjoined right now. But it's a bigger challenge to all of these requirements at this point. Um, in that litigation, the state, the Dayton Clinic had, um, I'm trying to think what happened, because the Dayton Clinic had an application pending, and so did the Cincinnati Clinic, with three backup doctors listed. And on the day before, I think, the day before the law went into effect, ODH denied both variance requests, and they told the Cincinnati Clinic, which is Planned Parenthood, oh, you only listed three doctors, you need four. They, there's no number in the law, by the way. Like, you know, the next time it's going to be five or, like, 11 or something. I don't know, <laughs> you know. It's my, my daughter's favorite number when she was little, 11 um, But, uh, you know, there's gonna, they, they just keep coming up with numbers, right? And so, actually, the... Um, the clinic went and found a fourth doctor and reapplied and was able to 
um, we were able to get the preliminary injunction against the automatic suspension at that point. So it's not, no one's going to lose their license overnight right now. But um, th that's the other thing that's so maddening is it's this moving target. So it used to be one. It used to be they just wanted like one and they'd prefer more. And then, you know, someone listed three out of an abundance of caution and then they said, okay, now we want three. And then three, the eve of litigation and uh, law going into effect, now it's four. You know, we, you know, it's just this number that I've just made up. So there's really the variance the language on the variance requirement is it's totally in the discretion. There's certain requirements, but then it kind of says it's totally in the discretion of the director whether to grant it or, or deny it. And, and the grant and the director can of health can, who by the way is not a doctor, can revoke it at any uh, point without um, you know without any reason. For is I think it literally says for any reason or no reason or something like that. No, it says for any reason for any reason can revoke it. So, so yeah. 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 Paul was saying, well, this facility could upgrade or Planned Parenthood could open one up. Right. And that doesn't look like clearly erroneous review. Right. Right. And I, I'd like to hear you talk. I agree. Yeah. And I think it was Alito's dissent that mainly went um, went deep into the question of what the evidence was. So one of the issues here was. And this came up at oral argument, too, in Whole Woman's Health. Was, well, how do we know these laws are actually closing the clinics? Maybe, maybe the clinics coincidentally <laughs> decided to close the day after this um, requirement went into effect, right? And, and the, the liberal justices were like, you have got to be kidding me. You know, this is like a controlled experiment that you couldn't even create on your own. So, and then the other thing that was kind of floating around in that is, well, you know, we're not concerned about clinics. Clinics don't have this constitutional right. We're concerned about women and women's access. So how do we know that the remaining clinics, the eight remaining clinics could not absorb the capacity uh, in Texas. And so there was kind of this debate over, you know, could, could the, you know, the Planned Parenthood in Austin, you know, assume 10,000 more patients a year when they're currently seeing like 8,000 total a year or 5,000? I don't know. I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head. But the, this is, again, another thing where it's very, very hard to actually get good numbers. I mean, I don't, I suppose there are probably analogies in other areas of the law where you can figure out capacity questions. But, you know, it does become this, like, well, could they buy the clinics that are closing and start running them? Well, how, you know, would they be able to get staff? Would they be able to hire doctors? Would they be able to, you know, would they be able to get financing? What kind of financing could they get? Like, right, like, uh, there was sort of a big question, I know, in that litigation at some point of how far down the rabbit hole are we going to go of trying to prove these answers about, you know, whether this is really having an impact on women's access. So I will say I agree. I think it was more um, – there's, this, there's this still this big question after Whole Woman's Health about who, who – but who does have this burden, right, So of, of coming forward with evidence? Because when you have a fundamental right, the rule in constitutional law is heightened scrutiny, and heightened scrutiny generally means the government bears the burden of proving, you know, the, the – um, the, the interest, the compelling or, you know, important interest behind the legislation and how the legislation meets that interest. And so normally the government is kind of bears the initial burden. Um, in this case, the court was a little ambiguous about that. I think that for a long time it was women who had to come forward with evidence of undue burden and that a large fraction of women were being prevented from accessing abortion and that these particular um, laws were to blame for that lack of access. And and that's kind of where Alito is still, I think. He's like, come on, it's your case. Prove it. Well, actually, that, that's not how it works. Like in the First Amendment, you want to restrict speech. If there's a sort of facial showing that the law restricts speech, it's the government's burden to justify it. It's the government's burden. That's what heightened scrutiny means. And so I think that that's what's going on in Whole Woman's Health is that the the majority is finally saying, you know, this is heightened scrutiny. Government, you've got to have some evidence. You don't get to sit back and say, no, prove that, okay, I disagree, prove it better, right, which is what, what has been going on all along. And, and, um, and Alito, I think, would still like to be in that world, because as we all know, I mean, where the burden lies, that's everything, right? Who has to prove it? Who, who bears the risk of not meeting the burden? That's a whole game, really. And I think, especially here, where the numbers, it's just so hard. It's just the numbers are hard to get a hold of. There's not a lot of good studies. It's, you know, 
this is a hard population to study, right? So, I know you had a question again, yeah. As uh, science advances and the notion of uh, viability uh, changes, is that a consideration for any of these, uh, any of the justices on the Supreme Court and yeah. regarding this fundamental right, will that have an impact on that down right. the road? Good question. I mean, I think the, the, this case, of course, Holman's Health didn't deal with those kind of late term viability kinds of issues that really are more difficult for, they're difficult for Justice Kennedy, certainly, who just signed on to Holman's Health, right, and didn't, didn't write or anything. Um, but a lot of people were worried that he, he would pull the court in the other direction. I think, you know, later abortion is where he gets off the train, honestly. Um, I think um, a lot of people do, you know, in the public, in the population. Um, you know, I don't know. So, so I'm obviously not a doctor or a, a medical researcher. Apparently, the point of viability moved back quite a bit between Roe and today, like maybe about six weeks or so in pregnancy. Um, it doesn't seem to have moved in quite some time, and you will read things that say, you know, look, we're just at the limit. Like, there just, there's just a point where, you know, lung capacity and other developmental things just can't happen outside the womb. But, I mean, on the other hand, to be fair, I think you hear that about other advances, right? And then all of a sudden somebody figures something out um, uh, that uh, undermines that. So, I mean, I, I can't say. I can't say whether that's going to happen or not. I do think... Um, the viability line is still there. It's still alive and well, you know, so to speak. And it could be, um, it, it definitely, if medical advances push that line back, I think uh, it, it's going to have an effect both politically and doctrinally on um, uh, the point at which abortion is, is legal. On the other hand, you know, maybe we can focus on making early abortion accessible. Maybe we can focus on, um, you know, again, increasing access to effective um, uh, contraception, and, and maybe the problem of late abortion doesn't become, you know, as prominent as it was. I mean, I suspect there will always be, it will always be around, but, but it doesn't become as prominent an issue. I don't really know what to say about it, I guess. Joel. As you know, there's been a, uh, a large shift in uh, human rights law uh, past born humans to animal rights. And as part of that international law and, and a lot of law in the states, there's been deference given by the courts, I think rightfully so, as someone who doesn't eat meat, uh, to uh, needless pain or mm -hmm. additional pain and mm -hmm. suffering of animals who are not born human beings under Casey. Mm -hmm. um, so do you see sort of long term this confluence of, of uh, kind of, uh, well, let me put it this way. Do you see a conflict coming for uh, those who think that uh, abortion rights should extend past significant pain? And, and that's a controversial issue, anywhere mm -hmm. from 8 to 15 weeks, but depending on, on uh, brain development, whatever you think it is, and whatever the method is, and, and those who think that that's at least a legislative function, not, not whether they should do it, but whether they can do it, mm -hmm. if, they are, if they can stop you from torturing a squirrel, can they stop you from torturing a 18 an 18 week fetus? You see that as a down the line question, because it's in the literature. It's, it's particularly in the literature from the people who teach at Notre Dame Law School. There's a, a there's a lot in that question. So, um, first, let me say because I, I know you don't want to get into um, in, into these technicalities, but I mean the most recent comprehensive sort of meta study of this issue indicates that fetal pain probably does not happen until about 29 weeks. Um, you know, the, the earliest any legislature has claimed is like 20, which is why some legislatures are trying to ban it at 20 weeks. I mean, it's, but I think the bigger piece of the question is, or, or the bigger question behind that, obviously, is sort of this question about sentient beings and pain and whether that's a, a sufficient reason for sort of restricting someone else's rights, right? And it's interesting because to the extent that that's the human rights framework for thinking about it, it's not at all, I mean, it's not at all in our 
not directly in our jurisprudence, is it? I mean, it's sort of, um, we think about, well, there are rights-bearing entities and there are non-rights-bearing entities. And then, you know, then on the other hand, we have the notion that even though animals are not rights-bearing entities, legislatures can outlaw uh, torturing them on moral grounds, which I guess is a, a point about pain, right, unnecessary pain. But there's not a lot of talk about pain as being the triggering um, uh, you know, or sentience as being the triggering uh, mechanism. Uh, so, you know, can, so I guess the question becomes, if, if fetuses feel pain, can you outlaw abortion on moral grounds? Is that a, a, an interest the state would have? Again, I think that that's essentially the argument behind a lot of these 20-week bans. And um, I, I think one, one straightforward answer is, well, you can give them anesthesia um, rather than if you're really concerned about pain, rather than um, uh, banning, banning abortion. Argument, but that, I, I don't disagree with that. But, uh-huh. then, but then Judge Kennedy gives the argument. There's a difference. There's a difference. Look, I, I think that the state has, um, has moral... I don't think there's any question that the state has moral claims in this, you know, in the abortion... Um, uh, you know, it, it, about abortion that it can make. I mean, even the post, even the viability line, I mean, make no mistake, the viability line doesn't say after viability the fetus is a person. It's not. It's not a person for 14th Amendment purposes. It doesn't have rights. The, that's, that's the moral line that the, um, the Supreme Court has drawn, right, as a point at which the state's interests, moral interests, override the woman's. Could we push it back a bit by pointing to uh, uh, questions about pain, I would say not, not as the law is currently written. Not, not as Casey and Roe are currently written, no. I mean, is there a, an argument there? That, that very well may be where the argument's going next. I mean, it's not, it's not frivolous. It's certainly not frivolous as an argument that, that, that if, if we could point to pain and pain being a problem and it not being able to be dealt with somehow, some other way, that, 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 that there could be a legitimate state interest there. Sure, sure. No one, by the way, wants to, like, have that trial. I mean, no, some people want to have that trial. The pro-choice folks don't want to have that trial, don't want to have that conversation, right? I mean, yeah, it's tough. Pain as relating to a, to a fetus is a frivolous argument? No, I said it's not frivolous. I, don't think, I think it is. You think it is? Yeah, it is. I think if you can show... You stated before, said that pain doesn't come until 29, 29 weeks, right. I mean, What is? The idea that they can, that, that fetal pain that justifies any lie. of this. What? The idea that you can lie and get away. Oh, yeah, no, I agree. I agree that it's, no, and so I agree that unless you have evidence, right, and this is where whole woman's health comes in. But I, I think that Joel's question was assuming, assume you have the evidence, and assume you can't deal with it in another way, which, again, why can't you just give fetal anesthesia um, and, and then uh, induce demise? I, you know, that... That seems to be the, the general answer to that complaint. But if, if there were some way in which you could set pain against, you know, privacy rights, I think it's not, like I said, I don't think there's room for that under the existing framework, but I think it's not a, it's, that's, that's where everyone is trying to put, where the, the pro-life folks are trying to push it, and that's, I think, you know, a non-frivolous point. But again, I think. But I think you're right that I don't think the evidence is there. I don't think there's facts to support it, and I don't think there's. I don't see a scenario where that's the only way out of the dilemma either. So. Yeah. Is this uh, is this area going to be an ongoing uh, battleground of litigation? Uh, partially because if you're talking about a balancing act, you're always going to have a individual circumstances will dictate. Uh, yeah decision yeah. in every case, or is there any way the courts can really put some, uh, make a decision uh, really suggesting some firmer lines and uh, reducing yeah. this as one of the hot topics in uh, I jurisprudence? Don't <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I think it's, it's going to be ongoing. I'm certain it's ongoing after whole woman's health. Um, uh, you know, and, and both because pro-choice groups are saying, let's, let's litigate, let's, let's challenge some new stuff. Um, the Ohio Right to Life, for example, their reaction was immediately, great, we're going to continue business as usual. We don't think this affects us at all, right? So everybody's pretty dug in. I mean, 
it always reminds me of what Justice Scalia used to say in his dissents, which is, you know, we should just get out of this area. We have no business being in abortion jurisprudence, and, and, and the court should just get out of it. How are you going to get out of it? I mean, even, again, even if you know, Trump appoints three justices and they're all, you know, anti-choice and they all get rid of Roe v. Wade, you're still, you're going to have litigation at the state level. You're going to have litigation on other grounds around, you know, other kinds of constitutional rights. I mean, the sort of the only way to, I think, to get out of it at this point is just to completely um, uh, repeal, you know, half of the Constitution because you're going to have First Amendment claims. You're going to have equal protection claims. You're going to have, you're always going to have claims. I think, um, that you know, to, in the end, it's going to be. I think the only the only answer could be a political one, not a um, a legal one. To if if politically people can come together, or you know, one side kind of loses or wins. But I don't. I can't see the the fight. You know, I I shouldn't say political. I guess if attitudes change, if the zeitgeist changes, if this suddenly becomes no longer controversial like it is not in many other countries, right, then maybe there's an end to it. Maybe, maybe wow, we have publicly supported access to early abortion and effective contraception, and, and nobody really thinks much about it anymore. That would be fantastic. But uh, I think, you know, short of something like that, it's just not, yeah, everybody's going to keep fighting. Oh. All right. Well, I, it looks like I'm, I'm at my time. So thank you very much. I appreciate the, the questions and the conversation.